We move on to the next uh, talk by Dr. Deepa Srinivasan from Pratt & Whitney on uh, hot corrosion in gas turbines. It's not moving here. Sorry about this. I'll just enable it and put it on the slideshow. Okay. While he's setting it up, thank thank you so much and good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to thank to Dr. Shamsundar, to Sabopal, and uh, uh, Professor Raja for actually including this topic. And uh, the more recent, I've been working on this hot corrosion for about 15 years now. But and there was a big lull. So more recently, it was inspired by a collaboration with or that we started off with Professor Bhopal here from the Pratt Whitney Center. Um, I think it's a nice um, you know, continuation from where Dr. Barshilia left. In the sense, he spoke about aircrafts, and I'm going to speak about that which powers the aircraft. And uh, you know, some of you would have taken um, you know, recent flights that you've come today and yesterday for this meeting. And a vast majority of them, if you're Indigo, Go Air, or SpiceJet, are powered by some uh, magnificent engineering marvels. Of course, naturally, they are Pratt & Whitney products. One of them is a gear turbofan, and many of these have been, uh, you know, many of these engines have been running for six to seven decades now. But uh, what has happened in the last, uh, let's say, from 2015-16 is the product line, and I'm just speaking through. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, and the, you know, and the product line here that I'm sh talking about, uh, the, the last, uh, if you don't mind, I have to request the chair to request not to take photographs. I really appreciate that Pat Whitney is very spindly and they allow us to present but not to publish. So I'll be happy to share any publications afterwards. Yeah. So um, so the more recent ones that you see that are boxed here, the V2500, the gear turbo fan, which is really absolutely uh, engineering marvel because it is completely fuel efficient. It is using sustained aviation fuel, some of the stuff that Mr. Manoj also spoke about a little bit. And, um, and uh, so, but, but the important thing about these is that, you know, it is now facing higher and higher temperatures. The operating temperatures are high. All the hot section components uh, and even the cooler components from the compressor blades, everything is seeing a better, higher efficiency and higher temperature. So naturally, you know, one of the things that comes into, people spoke very nicely about aqueous corrosion, stress corrosion, cracking, hydrogen, and so on. But what is bugging is uh, hot corrosion. And I'll, I'm going to talk about it in a minute because a lot of the times we are looking at oxidation at very high temperatures. And this chart shows you that somewhere upwards of 1,000 degrees. And the temperatures of the uh, service temperatures of the hot section components right from the combustor section that we're talking about are upwards of 600, 650 degrees centigrade. So something else comes into the picture. Again, I have to really request not to take photographs. Uh, Chair, I'll be taking two minutes more if I keep interrupting and saying this. So, uh, And I'm actually trained. I'm so sorry. I'm trained to look for that. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're talking of hot and harsh. And I think one of the... Um, uh, one of the objectives of a workshop like this and the ages of many uh, bodies out here, and earlier also Dr. Shansundar has started, is to foster collaboration. So with the view, with that view in mind, I thought I'll just share some of the recent work we have done in the area of hot corrosion. What are the challenges and where we could definitely do with a lot of help? I think uh, Mr. Romakant also spoke about it a little bit before. I will end with that in about five or six slides. So hot and harsh because, you know, high temperature, very high pressures, um, and, uh, you know, running, you know, speeds of the order of 20, 30,000 RPM. So we're talking of something which is surreal uh, almost, uh, and, and no fuel, even the SAFs that we're talking about today um, are not free of any of the pollutants or corrodents uh, in terms of salts, especially those that are ingested from the atmosphere. In fact, you might have seen a lot in the news uh, recently, Pratt & Whitney, whenever I go out, when I say I'm from Pratt & Whitney, I mean, people say, oh, you know, as if I'm the entire manufacturer of the engine itself. Uh, with that fame, they say, oh, Brad Mitney is in the news because, uh, you know, engines have been grounded by Indigo and Go Air. Yes, and one of the reasons 
was indeed hot corrosion, so it's very timely as well. So if you look at the temperature ranges, the previous chart told you where oxidation sets in because we are on Earth. High temperature oxidation is inevitable. And for any structural engineer, let's say a, high, a blade, which is the heart of the engine where the thermal energy, um, you know, mechanical energy and thermal energy, I mean, thermal energy becomes from the combustion mechanical energy, which actually runs the turbine blades, which are about, you know, three inches this long. And with the foil shape pretty much similar to this pointer. Uh, what happens there is much before uh, oxidation sets in, reaction with the fuel and the fuel corrodents actually starts eating away many things of the thermal barrier coating. And then there is an oxidation protection coating both inside and outside. And then, of course, inevitable is hot corrosion. So this is a blade. You can see practically it's like a moth-eaten leaf. You can see it, and obviously we can't, uh, you know, inspection Techniques are available, I mean, visual inspection, non-destructive has not yet reached a stage, um, you know, where you can actually inspect a blade inside, uh, you know, an assembled engine yet, even if it is at room temperature. And this is a vane. You can again see a very, very complex uh, cooling divergent and uh, radial cooling that is there, where the compressor discharge air comes and cools. But even there, you're facing this. And typical temperature ranges, we have two types of corrosion. Just before oxidation sets in, we have type 1. That's a high temperature upwards of 800, 850 degrees centigrade. And little above 650 degrees centigrade uh, is where we talk of type 2 corrosion. And typically, a large combination of salts, depending on whether it's a disc, a disc which is a blade carrier, whether it's a stetoric vein or a rotating blade, or even some of the combustion components. So as, as we all know in the structural integrity, we are looking at when a pit transitions into a crack. And that's a dialogue Professor Gopal and I started with having. He said, I'll do all the modeling. He found a lot of challenges. We said, we'll do the experimental verification, even more challenges for it. So this is, these are typical examples of uh, pits, and I'm going to share some recent work lately. But you can see this V2500 engine, uh, as I told you, the higher the temperature uh, that, that has come into force in the last six to seven years in the product line. Please don't take pictures. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, so we are looking at, so what we did is we brought this recent, uh, you know, the claim to fame or infame of the Pratt Whitney engines because of a nickel-based superalloy uh, disc, aero engine disc, which was subjected to, you know, which had to be pulled out for various reasons. One amongst that was feared as cost corrosion. And what happens is you're not able to detect these pits. And if you do a quick study, you know, a simple laboratory study, both in situ corrosion, by which what we mean is we corrode it and then we do a low cycle fatigue test, or we actually do the low cycle fatigue test. We don't have any laboratory, at least in India, where you can do the test while you're continuously fluxing uh, the salts with sulfur. So uh, these are all more static experiments, but that's the best we can have. And you can see some of the pits in the blades. If you can see, this is an actual blade, and you can see very fine pits. The only way we are able to gauge it is a, with this very fine pit depth gauge, uh, you know, that, that we all use in all, all other product lines that we spoke about and we heard talks in the last couple of days. But you can see a clear fatigue debit out here. Uh, even in these experiments, which are not the bestest of experiments to replicate an actual condition in an aero engine. And soon after, this is a nickel-based superalloy microstructure, uh, and that has gamma gamma prime, the strengthening phase. First, what happens is you get a precipitate free zone uh, right at the top, you know, wherever there is pit formation. And obviously, pitting is not going to be uniform. Uh, somebody else spoke about various forms of uh, corrosion, I think the previous speaker. We are, I'm just going to address pitting corrosion here. And then soon what happens is it forms an easy path for actually not just intergranular crack, but more importantly, oxidation in the grain boundaries, which is worse. Uh, even a crack can be arrested because of the, you know, the strengthening precipitates of the microstructure. But the oxidation that takes place, and then that leads to more sulfidation and so on and so forth. It's actually mind-boggling to see what is the reaction kinetics at that reaction zone, leave alone be able to use AI and ML to predict. So what we did is 
and this is a big uh, you know this is a big area and the best we could do was to take cylindrical ASTM samples and then make notches out of it uh, of various dimensions of notches again to get a notch without any manufacturing machining uh, you know, the uh, machining KT factor structure, you know, uh, factor is very difficult. So we need to take care of that. Obviously, we can't do short peening in a notch that small because it doesn't, and how do you measure the residual stress? So I'm just giving you uh, all the difficulties and what best you can do to, you know, adopt this and put a safety factor in the design. So we launched, uh, you know, a couple of uh, uh, detailed characterization studies, of course, at IASC. It's very recent work done in the last uh, year, actually. We took five different nickel-based superalloys, which are actually in the engine, three of them powder metallurgy, one rot and one cast. And these are all upwards, I told you, of temperatures of 700 degrees centigrade. And look at the reaction kinetics, and we also looked at what are the nature of uh, hot corrosion that is happening, what are the oxides, what are the ceramics that actually form, so that at least what we could do out as a result of this study is to, to tell the repair shop, the MRO, that these are the oxides that form. It could be nickel oxide, it could be a spinel, it could be a very complex oxide uh, that reacts with the sulfur. And what is the chemical that you can use very quickly to etch it and then, uh, you know, uh, grid blast it and make it ready for repair? You know, is it a well repair or based on the inspectability and acceptability criteria? So uh, before that, what we did is we wanted to see the diagnostics. Are we even able to do this precisely? So we did a laboratory experiment. We took simply sodium chloride, sodium sulfate mixture, put fluxed it by atomization, just put a slurry. We tried different techniques, drop method and so on in the lab. This was in collaboration with Professor Harpreet in IIT Roper. We had a master's students who, who was working in our lab. And we tried varied composition. You can see on the y-axis different temperatures, 630, 675, and 700, based on the simple eutectic out here. These are the tie lines. And we looked at different chemistries of sodium chloride, sodium sulfate mixtures. Of course, 100% sodium chloride and 100% sodium sulfate. And then we formulated uh, all the pitting kinetics very, very carefully with multiple uh, repeatability in the lab. And then we carried out a methodology or a standard operating procedure of how do we measure these spits non I mean, sorry, destructively. So once you know destructively, it's some samples, and we can use a non-destructive gauge. And this is simple optical macrograph with image analysis. And then we cut the sample multiple times through the pits. We are actually took a normal distribution plot, a viable statistics of the minimum and the maximum pit with as much statis statistics that we could get. And then looked at the pit characteristics, depth, height, uh, pit width and of course chemical analysis. And then we went on to do this, if you can see the you know video there, the simple GIF file that goes from macro photographs to optical microscopy to you know doing EPMA, that is electron probe microanalysis, and then of course advanced transmission electron microscopy, very carefully using the focused ion beam machining to extract these very brittle oxides on top of the pit. It was not easy. We had to lose many samples, and of course we were charged so several lakhs per hour for using the facility, but I mean, all in good faith. So we did this for five different alloys, actually, uh, which are running in various engines. These are all disc alloys because really you don't want a disc failure. Even a blade failure is okay, but you know, a disc which is three and a half, four feet in diameter, you know, the, uh, the impact of it is catastrophic, not just for the passengers in the aircraft, but for the surroundings as well. So we were able to characterize uh, this for five different alloys and give a recipe, as I told for the repair shop uh, to say which acid combination you use so that you can remove the oxide layer, uh, different oxides on different materials. And these are the different reaction zones, uh, as I told you, to uh, formulate a small model, which will tell you that how long will a pit take for an intergranular crack and then an oxidation. And that's where we are right now with this project. So I thought I'll leave it with you. What are the mitigation plans? I'll just end with it. I have only one more slide. What we do is typical aero engine components to combat corrosion, particularly right from water washing, you know, just water that you wash to remove the dirt when a plane takes off and lands, more so in an in industrial gas turbine because it's sitting out there in a desert or maybe even powering electricity in uh, Bangalore out here in Bescom. Then from there all the way to the end, the afterburner, you have all forms of corrosion. I only spoke about hot corrosion because it is quite uh, painful. Uh, so we have about 3,000 or 4,000 types of uh, different types of coatings to actually address corrosion particularly. And uh, then so now we are working on how does, uh, you know, 
you know, in parallel, since we know there are coatings, how does this hot corrosion start to affect coatings? So this is this is a simple recipe to say that we have actually sprayed it on a prototype, and you can see we're looking at the pit formation and kinetics. This is a bond coat layer out here. This is a thermal barrier coating. Of course, thermal barrier coating has my, many more implications because it forms low melting eutectics with the salts, uh, which could be even more catastrophic. And this is the base metal that I spoke to you about, uh, about which we did the pitting characteristics. So. This is where we are right now. I'm definitely, while I thank all our collaborators and the team members who carried out this work out here, I definitely like to call out for, you know, I, I spoke to Professor Raja maybe 12, 13 years ago to ask him, um, you know, is there a hot corrosion facility in India, but uh, I'm still searching for it. So definitely Dr. Sham Sundar, Professor Gopal, uh, Professor Raghu Prakash as part of the INSIS, if there's some opportunity we can do to collaborate and set up a facility, I mean, that would be wonderful. And thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Are there any quick questions? One, yeah. We know about pitting at aqueous conditions, ambient temperatures. I'm asking because this alloy is heterogeneous chemically, because your phases are different kind. Do you have an idea where does this originate, this pitting? Uh, I mean, it's not a classical pitting, but where does it originate? Is that something, these phases are more detrimental or is there some depletion of some elements are more problematic? No, uh, not really, because it's mm -hmm. the fluxing itself is heterogeneous, right? Because all sodium, magnesium, all kinds of vanadates, all kinds of sulfates which come from, you know, the fuel and the atmosphere, even the best of pristine aviation fuel. So this, the pitting just takes place as the flux, uh, you know. Why is, why is there no lateral growth? Of there, there doesn't have to be any lateral growth because oh. you can have, in the fluxing is not uniform like this. So it's just the salt that is making it. Yeah, it's just a so salt so it's time at temperature. So, so that's why we carried out this so study. So it's not a typical pitting that we normally talk about. Which the surrounding yeah. area becomes a cathode. Yes. And the, the area becomes an anode. Not that definition of pitting. That not that definition. Yeah. It is and random. And, and that's why I'm showing you yeah. the small coupon in the lab. We tried, you know, multiple people doing it. Even with different human beings doing spraying the salts, there was variability in the pitting location. Yes, problem. yes. Okay. Metal problem takes place afterwards, as yeah, I showed right. you in the intergranular region. Okay. And it's more, and it's also a gamma prime oxidation. Precipitate oxidizes, not just the grain boundary. So it's, it's quite complex. Thank you. Thank you. A very nice, uh, I'm Lakshman from IIT Madras. Uh, very nice presentation. Okay. On the similar lines, I do have a question with uh, continuing with Professor Raja asked. Uh, does these uh, alloys do have pre-oxidized uh, film on top of it? No, what we, some of, these are all hot section components. So without any, except the aero engine disc that I showed you, I think I showed you a picture here. All the others, the blade that I showed you and the others, almost all of them have oxidation bond coat. Many of them at the stage one, they have a top coat, which is a ceramic. Okay, my, my question is, uh, if I'm not put so it in the right way, I just want to ask you when you did this uh, analysis of random pitting because of, this is type 2 or corrosion, if I'm yes, understanding. Yes, the one right. we did is, I'm showing is type 2, type two we've yeah. done type 1 as so well. So don't you expect that there's a already a, a the first phase of your change would be on the oxide growth, and then it sets into the fluxing of a sulfur into the system to produce non-uniform pitting? Well, you start, see, the interaction is very complex. It first, the sulfur actually goes in based on the concentration of the mix mixture of oxide. That's where we sh we did that simple uh, thing for with Rahul's thesis of three compositions, 2%, 10%, 20%, 30%. So what happens is it dip it, there is a tie line shift as well. So sulfur ingresses in based on the uh, concentration. And then that reacts, there is a reaction product in the base metal. As I told you, there is gamma prime that's, loss. That's the question. I'm sorry to interrupt again. Yeah. The first reaction would be the oxidation. Of oxidation, the, of right. course. You'll yes, have a film yes. formed. The film then is a multiple film. Yeah. Absolutely. You're right. I mean, it does form. So what we have is based on the concentration. For example, we have uh, chrome oxide forming right next to the base metal with the reaction product that I'm showing here. Because the top is chrome oxide, then the topmost is nickel oxide. In between, there's a spinel. In some of the alloy chemistries, it's iron oxide. It's not even nickel oxide. And the spinel is very different. Okay. Yeah. Because so I th this, uh, this thing that I'm showing you, it's a very all these uh, electron micrographs are to characterize what is the nature of the oxide. 
Okay. Yeah. Because somewhere I had read that that the pre-oxidation of the surface does change the behavior of uh, hot corrosion kinetics. Okay. Is okay. it right or? Well, oxidation is inevitable because we're talking of such temperatures. But uh, the nature of the pitting also depends on how the oxide scales are adherent or some okay. of sometimes they are porous. Even here we have seen, if you look at the cross section out here, this is uh, this is where is the base metal. Here is almost amorphous. And here it's full of pores. Even the oxide is brittle. So it allows for ingression of more oxygen. It doesn't mean that the oxide keeps form forming in thicker and thicker. Yeah, I understand that, yeah. that part. Thank you. And the kinetics. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, in the. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I have to ask, so because I have collaborated with you. Uh, one of the reasons, if you look at steel pitting, so you have two things happening. One is the oxidation and the diffusion. And when the metal electrolyte diffuses into metal, then the pitting starts. Here it is not. So the reason why I'm saying is, it is much more complex. I don't know what it is. The reason is, is uh, once the oxidation happens, Diffusion doesn't happen the way it happens in, uh, and that's what our uh, uh, our modeling showed. It was only going on the surface and pits were not forming and uh, we were not exactly replicating what is happening there. Mm -hmm. That is something that we don't understand. Although we call it as pitting, it is vastly different from what is happening in steel. So I just wanted to say that. Sure, thanks. I think we can talk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll stop here and uh, you can always do the discussions yeah. uh, presentation medium uh, from what I understand I think professor Parida is online so if uh, he's ready maybe we will have his talk and afterwards we will have uh, dr. Raghuveer Singh if that is not the case then we will start the next lecture by dr. Raghuveer Singh from NML <laughs>